so I'm Catriona Pearson and I'm the exhibitions coordinator here. So I sort of acted as kind of project coordinator for Spellbound uh, from the exhibitions office and did all the sorts of uh, project planning, timetabling and logistical arrangements. And I'm Agnes Valenjak and I am head of exhibitions here at the Ashmolean. And with regard to Spellbound, I pulled together the uh, implementation of the architecture in the main. Essentially, it worked like any exhibition. Um, the curators approached us with an idea and gave several presentations. The lovely thing about Sophie and Marina, they had already a very clear idea as to what they wanted to say. Now, part of any exhibition is um, you come up with a dream scenario and then it's about implementation. Inevitably, some things fall by the wayside. It's impossible to do everything. Um, we're both restricted, you know, every museum is restricted in space and people and resources. So there were some ideas we couldn't pursue. Um, and then it's a, it's a long process before we then move into interpretation. And maybe you can say a little bit more about that, because that yeah. was a long process as well. So, uh, as Agnes said, they already came to us with a, a very well thought out proposal based on all of the research. So we didn't have to start from scratch no. with the story. It was already very well developed. Uh, so then the challenge was then getting the objects all together. Once we had a good idea of what was going to be in the show, we started working with the curators and our interpretation editor to uh, create a narrative out of that that would run, run through the three galleries. So they already knew what they wanted the three galleries to do, but within it's about using that space, and which we obviously know really well because we do every exhibition in it. Um, so we then start developing what the key themes are in each room, what are the standout objects, and kind of building the story around that and developing a flow that's going to I mean the visitor comes out with the story that the curators want to tell them. Um, so that takes uh, a lot of time from about sort of mm -hmm. 18 months onwards we're kind of developing that narrative. At the same time the curators are also working on the publication so there's a lot of crossover there and that helps them kind of get, get their ideas together. And, get and the it changes themes. some of the things. And it, and it changes and bo both these yeah, sort of influence yeah. each other and, and things change. And you have to kind of keep it flexible when we're finding out about loans through that process. So objects might drop out or we might get extra things added in. We were still working with the, the artists to, to find out what their contribution was going to be, what the new artworks were going to be like. Um, and how much space they needed. How much space they needed. Um, so, so that interpretation lasts from sort of 18 months mm. right up until the, the writing of the text, which, which was finished a with a few months to go. And that's the, the yeah. biggest, one of the biggest jobs for the curators is then to produce a huge volume in, in this instance, because there are so many objects of exhibition text uh, to, to finish telling that story. Uh, so no, I knew very little about any of the three subject areas in the exhibition because I did an art history background, so this is not my area at all. Um, particularly the middle gallery, the ritual concealment, I'd never even heard of people doing this, so this was completely foreign to me. So I was quite a good test visitor to introduce <laughs> some completely new themes to. Um, and I think I was, well, in the early meetings I was I was very interested by it because I think I was sort of, well, we, we really like to say that I am quite a magical thinker and Agnes is not a magical thinker. So, <laughs> so I was sort of very much believing in all these little rituals and things already. Um, I won't walk under the ladder, for example. I um, will. <laughs> so, um, so it wasn't, uh, I didn't have any knowledge of any of the sort of subject areas, but I was interested just in being generally kind of interested in that sort of magical side of things. I didn't know about the concealment again. And I come, because I'm a foreigner as well, I, I do know a fair amount of the, the medieval period um, and the, the, alongside the religious persecutions as well. It was different on several levels. One, we worked with architects, uh, not exhibition designers, and there is a difference. <laughs> um, to the object and the variety of the objects made it quite a challenge. Um, in addition, although that was mainly Catriona's battle, 
Um, we had a lot of lenders who are not accustomed to lending. You want to say a yeah, bit so more? so uh, a lot of private lenders. So but even all, museums. All, uh, and some, some very and sort of small local museums as well, but um, many lenders that had never lent before and so weren't aware of the process. So we just need to give that additional level of support. A lot of the, the very smaller museums and the private lenders, they obviously don't have conservators, they don't have those in-house sort of technicians or registrars to do all the things that we would normally do when sending an object out on loan. So providing that extra level of support to enable them to lend. Um, so that was a challenge for our conservators as well, bringing in all these objects that had just been found in people's homes. So, you know, we don't know what condition they're in. They've never been displayed in any way before. They're literally just sort of found in, in bundles and, uh, and then brought into us. So that, that was the, the biggest new, new thing for us, I think. Uh, yeah, for, for me, it was the, the sheer volume of objects and the volume of lenders. So we, we had what was it, 194 objects in the end in the exhibition. And 40 now, lenders. Part of, a lot of those were actually caches of sort of 20 objects, counting as one object for our purposes. So it was more objects, I think, than we've ever had in a show. Um, and it was the most lenders we've ever had to deal with. It was 51 on lenders um, that is far more than we would normally deal with and it did make it incredibly challenging because there's only one person dealing with all those lenders so just the the sheer volume of communication that had to happen between getting a loan approved and actually getting it here in time for the exhibition it just meant that you were having so many more emails to deal with than, than usual to actually to make all the arrangements and when it came to installation most lenders send couriers, as is normal museum practice, uh, to timetable that installation period so tightly, sort of down to 10 minute periods of when each lender needed to be there. We have so many shared showcases, so lenders mm. would need to be present at the same time because their objects were going to be going into a case with 10 other lenders' things at the same time. So that, just having so many lenders made a lot of things very challenging. Um, as, through the whole process, so just the, the communication all the way through, but then specifically making that installation period um, very, very tight, and the deinstallation period, which is still to come, which will be great. And that in turn, the number of objects caused another problem also for the display, mm -hmm. because in terms of architectural exhibition display, you need to accommodate every single object, because what's the point of it if you're just stacking them up on top of each other? So. Um, you have to have an adequate space for the labels because, again, what's the point in having it if you're not explaining it? And you have to have space for the mount making and all of the details. So in turn, that made the whole process very difficult mm. because physically there are limitations in how big a showcase can be. Yeah. Uh, it's just a pra pragmatic thing to, to, to do. Mm. <laughs> and the work that I've been having that many objects it just sort of spirals and affects all the departments mm. here so the conservators everything needs to be checked and photographed and and, it needs a, and usually needs a mount mm. made for it so just getting all of that stuff ready to go mm. in time it, I mean there wasn't anyone here that it that wasn't affected by the, yeah. by the number of objects so actually I think the most rewarding was how the public has responded to the exhibition by and large. It's been really popular from the outset um, and I can't tell you why, maybe, maybe because it's a little bit of a surprise, it's not a classical Ashmolean exhibition, it's not art and archaeology in the strictest word, but for me that's certainly been one of the aspects. The other one is that uh, even from within the museum, um, some, of, some of our colleagues who wouldn't who were not directly involved, um, really enjoyed it, you know, and have gone to see it. Mm. Uh, so many times our colleagues, you know, I'm thinking finance or HR, you know, they don't really go and see the exhibitions because they don't have to, but they've really enjoyed it too. So that's actually, I think, made it worthwhile. Mm. I think the marketing campaign yeah. as well is well particularly well. rewarding and we've had a lot of feedback from visitors. We, I mean, we don't often get yeah. feedback on specifically the video that we saw on YouTube or on Facebook or yeah. uh, this poster that we saw in this place. 
um, they did something very different, our, our marketing team, with this exhibition. And it was more creative, a bit more adventurous, and it really paid yeah. off. And yeah. I think that you know it sort of opens yeah. opens it out to what we can do in the future yeah. um, with our marketing campaigns. But it's it's worked so beautifully. It's integrated into the exhibition. It's all around the museum. You see it everywhere you go. Uh, and so using this, the photographer mm. that we used was, I think, really, yeah. it was a really, really good idea and it's it's paid off, I think. Yeah, it's but it was really very well. specific. I mean, yeah. yes, I have to say. And the, the challenges with this exhibition was, and we have come up with this, this is just, I'm not going mm. back to challenges, but um, in the past, when we've had uh, an exhibition, like which is quite complex and has lots of objects, finding one object to sum up what the show is about is really really difficult and we've never found that mm. no, it's so not much easy. like this yeah. this yeah. Well, this was the worst example because yes. what there isn't object do you use the three rooms were so different so mm. anything you know we could have used one of the beautiful manuscripts from the first room there were some lovely images there mm. but it's not representative of what the whole exhibition is similarly you know there's something from the last room that it it just doesn't work in terms of what, what to to tell the visitor what they're going to see. You have to give them a sense of what they're going to get from the exhibition. Um, we couldn't use anything from you know, the middle room. It's sort of um, those ob all the found objects. They lose, co w without the context, they're just n a nothing. A shoe is a shoe. No, yeah. a sh it's a shoe. It's <laughs> what am I going to see? What is this exhibition about? A heart with nails in it. With, if you don't know what that is, and I, again, you know, I didn't know anything about this ritual concealment, so average visitor probably doesn't, so they're not going to understand what that heart with the nails mm. in it is. So that's why they ended mm. up having to think outside the box and do a completely different campaign, not using any museum objects, not using anything that you're going to see in the show, but giving a sense yeah. of what the overall yeah. feeling yeah. is when you, you move through the yeah. three rooms. I think they did that beautifully. Yeah. My understanding of it, I mean, it has been learning completely from scratch about all, all the different areas, you know, so everything. I mean, I didn't know very much about witch trials, sort of like vague understanding from school, but I didn't, I didn't know much, which is terrible. Um, the, the ritual, as I said before, I didn't know anything about the ritual concealment and, um, and the other, even the medieval galleries, there was a lot, a lot of sort of themes and things that were familiar, but those particular objects, I've never studied, we haven't had mm. those in the museum on display before so for me uh, all of it was was fresh which is really interesting um, and I still my, my actual understanding of magical thinking sort of the, the concept I think it's just being reinforced because I, yeah as I said I was mm. sort of already I was already a magical thinker um, I like to think the more cynical of us within the museum have now changed and are becoming a bit more of magical thinkers mm. but um, yeah. no, no. Uh, <laughs> No, still no. <laughs> no, it hasn't changed much of my thinking. But what I found the most interesting in terms of complementing the knowledge I have already of the Middle Ages, and in a way the fact that um, these little rituals were sitting alongside official beliefs and re religion, religious practices. That's really what I found. You know, St. Michael is a case in point. You know, St. Michael is the, is the archangel you see everywhere. Most of the first. Uh, chapels are dedicated to <laughs> and yet to put him in the exhibition sort of slightly came from a different mm. angle uh, which I wasn't expecting you know mm. so that kind of complements the knowledge I have yeah. I think the museum has benefited from reaching a wider audience it's, it's definitely a different targeted audience, yeah. that, that yeah. kind of different audience like a younger mm. audience which we we had hoped it would do uh, to bring in that that much, mm. uh, I th a lot of that's to do with the marketing campaign. I think um, it was particularly attractive. It was really really good to use online, and so I think we had a lot more interest on social media than we normally have. So that's reaching maybe a, a different a different type of audience. So I think we've we've mm. achieved what we wanted to there with um, getting a, bro a broader audience in uh, to the museum. hasn't changed my thinking at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm about the same, which, um, so I'll give you an example. I did, a, I did a love lock on a bridge once, so like that kind of thing. So I really liked having them there because I did one in Paris before they cut them off the bridges. Um, 
but I'm so I was very much like I, I think that's a really nice thing to do. I, I just sort of I just look at the bridge and I'm just like oh, oh, don't do that. I know, <laughs> um, but like that those kind of things, you know, mm. I sort of I don't I don't know why. And it's it's little things, the little things that you you sort of do. It has made me question why why do you do them more? Whereas before, I think I just sort of would mm. do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever said I was superstitious or extremely superstitious, but when you start thinking about it, there might be like little, just little things that you sort of always do in your family. Um, but it has made me think more about that and why people do that, why they've always done it and will continue to do it. So it's made me just question it a little bit more. But I think my level of magical thinking is about, yeah. about the same. So yeah, I still want to go on to it.